Hi everyone, welcome back to Useful Genetics. This is Lecture 7H, where we're finally going to get to the secret molecular side of meiosis and understand how the homo homologous chromosomes find each other and how crossing over happens. Um, all of this is mediated by base pairing. So we've answered two of our three questions about how meiosis solves its problems. It's able to ensure that each haploid cell gets a complete set of chromosomes by first pairing the homologs and then using the same separate the partners strategy that mitosis uses. The sets that result are a random mixture of chromosomes because when the homologs are paired, the kinetochores are oriented randomly and you can't predict which chromosome is going to get pulled to which pole. The final problem, randomizing alleles that are on the same homologous chromosome, is solved by crossing over. Crossing over also solves a couple of other problems that we didn't really mention. One is, how do the homologs recognize each other when they pair up? And how are they tied together so they don't come apart too soon? I'm going to start with a drawing of chromosomes in meiosis 1 to remind you what the problem is. What's wrong with this drawing? Something's definitely wrong. And what's wrong with this drawing is that the wrong homologs are paired. The big dad chromosome should be paired with the big mom chromosome, but it's still paired with a little dad chromosome. And the big mom chromosome is paired with one of the dad chromosomes, but it's not the right one. So the Daughter chromosomes are definitely going to get the wrong sets, incomplete, mixed up sets of chromosomes if this meiosis went to completion. Okay, here's a little simulation of meiosis just to remind you of how it works. I've got four chromosomes here, two homologs of a short chromosome and two homologs of a longer chromosome. The first thing that's going to happen is that the DNA is going to replicate. So red homologs have replicated and our orange homologs have replicated. Now the homologs are going to find their partners, and they do this just by randomly moving around the cell. Uh, we'll discuss later exactly how this happens. Eventually, they find their partners and align along their whole length. Once they've aligned, they're pulled by spindle fibers in kind of a tug of war that gradually moves them to the center of the cell. And once all the chromosomes are paired and at the center of the cell, they're pulled apart into two daughter cells, and the cell divides. Now, let's go back to our flat two-dimensional drawings of meiosis. Um, the first steps are, after DNA replication, the sister chromatids stay together, just like in mitosis, and then the homologs are brought together and locked side by side. And this allows the homologs to be pulled apart by the spindle fibers. One homolog to each daughter cell. But how do they find each other? How do they line up correctly? So here's another problem. Oh. The answer is that they find each other and line up correctly and are held together by base pairing. Remember base pairing? We talked about base pairing in module one and in module two when we talked about DNA replication and mutation. But base pairing is back because it plays an essential role in meiosis. So base pairing is how the homologs find their partners, how they remain precisely aligned. So to help you think about this, I want you to look at this other wrong drawing of chromosomes in meiosis 1. What's wrong here? And the problem here isn't that the sister chromatids are not together. They are together. It's not that the wrong homologs are paired. The right homologs are paired. It's not that the DNA shouldn't have replicated yet. The DNA should have replicated yet, and it has. 
The problem is that the homologs are incorrectly aligned. They've found their right partners, but they haven't lined up the same sequences. So the mom and dad chromosomes are offset. The sequence that's here in the mom chromosome has its homolog over here in the dad's chromosome lined up with a completely different sequence. Here, the two chromosomes ends are lined up, but they're the wrong way around. So that the DNA sequence that's here on the mom chromosome has its homolog over here. Now, let's also go back to our picture of um, how cross of the results of crossing over before we look at how crossing over happens. So here are two chromosomes in your mom that are going to undergo meiosis, a chromosome from her mom and a chromosome from her dad. Here's the chromosome that you inherited, and you can see that it's a mixture of sequences, a recombinant of that sequence and then that sequence and then back up to that version and down to that version from grandpa. The same with the chromosome you inherited from your dad. It starts with a bit from his dad, your paternal grandfather, then a bit from his mom, from his dad, and another bit from his mom, your grandmother. How does this happen? So I said, well, base pairing. How does base pairing come into this? So I've redrawn the chromosomes, this time exaggerating the size of the DNA to remind you that each chromatid is a double helix of base paired DNA, drawing in a few base pairs just to remind you that this is double-stranded DNA. And what happens in preparation for meiosis is that at some places the DNA in the chromatids breaks. And a single strand at these breaks, a single strand unzips from its partner. It stops being base paired and it's just floating free away from the body of the chromosome with its base is exposed so it's able to form base pairs. Now these single strands then feel around for another strand they can base pair with. You can imagine this as being kind of like a crowded party in the dark where everybody's feeling around to find their partners. But there's a complication, there's a rule, like a party game, a rule that says that the new partner can't be in the sister chromatid. So this DNA can't find a partner over here. It has to find a partner in the other homolog, and the same for this sequence here. So here's what happens. Now the homologs are held together by base pairing between DNA strands that came from different homologs, DNA-based strands that have never been together in the history of the universe. Here's a blown up view of what that base pairing looks like. We can see the black is the double-stranded DNA from one homolog, and the blue, the green, is the strand coming in from the other homolog. And you can see that this strand has actually invaded the double helix and pushed the other strand out of the way so that it can form base pairs with its homologous complementary strand. And this is the base pairing that ensures that not only are the homologs paired with the right partners, but they're precisely aligned to a resolution of a single base pair, so that when crossing over happens, it's going to occur at precisely homologous places and no sequences will be lost. So. The result of this um, strand invasion is that the homologous chromosomes are correctly paired for mitose, for metaphase, they're precisely aligned for crossing over, and they're broken in a few places. So why does meiosis bother with crossing overs? 
Well, evolutionary biologists will tell you that, well, crossing overs make new combinations of the parental alleles, and that's the whole point of having sexual reproduction. But cell biologists will give you a different explanation. They'll say that crossovers tie the homologs together so that they stay together during the first steps of meiosis and remain together as they're tugged by the spindle fibers and they come to align properly at the center of the cell in the area called the metaphase plate. Now, we haven't made a crossover yet. We've just got single strands wandering around interacting with their homologs. How crossovers happen because sometimes these broken strands rejoin with the wrong partners. The strand invasion events will happen at multiple places on the chromosomes, and they may occur between different participants as well. Drawing a couple more just to strengthen the diagram. But most of these places where strands have invaded, ensuring that the chromosomes are aligned along their whole length, most of these places are repaired. The DNA strands let go of their connection to their homologs. They go back where they belong, and the breaks are repaired. But at some places, at one or a few places in each pair of homologs in meiosis, the ends of the broken strands instead join with the wrong partners. So these blue strands become physically joined to these light blue strands. And these light blue strands, which I'll draw in green, become physically joined to these dark blue strands. Now the homologs are tied together by this crossing over of the connection. You'll often see incorrectly in drawings, you'll see the blue chromosome moved over here and the light blue chromosome moved over here. That doesn't happen. All that moves is the connection. The, D the sister chromatids stay where they were, but the connection between them has switched over. And all the genes are intact. No sequences have been lost or gained at the point the, the Rejoining is mediated by base pairing, even though it's with the wrong partner, so it's with the homologous sequences. Now, I've said, well, the crossover ties the homologs together, but really, you might ask, yeah, why don't they come apart when the spindle fibers first pull on them? So the spindle fiber is going to pull on here and here, pull them apart, why doesn't the whole thing then come apart like this? This is not what happens, and it doesn't happen because it's not just the crossovers that tie the homologs together. There's another factor that has to be in place. And that factor is that the sister chromatids are tied together by cohesin. Remember cohesin from mitosis? Cohe <coughs> cohesin is the loop of protein that ties the sister chromatids together. And here I've indicated it by red loops. I haven't shown the loops as passing around the DNA, but in fact they do pass around the DNA. So the DNA is tied to its sister. So when the spindle fibers pull on the kinetochores, the top part of the chromosome of, can come of the homologs can come apart like this, but the bottom part can't come apart because the new covalent connection, this new covalent connection, ties this assembly to this assembly, which is connected to this kinetochore, so that this sister chromatid is being pulled in this direction by the spindle fiber pulling on the kinetochore, and it's being pulled in this direction by the spindle fiber pulling on the other kinetochore. This is the source of the tension 
that holds the chromatids and the homologous chromosomes together so they are pulled in the tug of war with the spindle fibers and wind up aligning at the center of the cell. So all of this, the pairing and aligning and the breaking and the joining and the tying together, it all happens early in meiosis one, be um, partly before the chromosomes are even visible, while they're still very diffuse and invisible in the cell. But now that all this has happened, meiosis one can work just like mitosis. This is a drawing of mitosis, not meiosis. So here's what happens. The home, once the homologs are tied together, two sisters, two sisters, two homologs, the opposing spindle fibers pull on them, pulling in both directions. With the same, spindle fibers don't stay attached at the kinetochord unless they experience tension from a pulling fiber, spindle fiber pulling in the opposite direction, just like in mitosis. And this pulling continues until all of the chromosomes are aligned at the metaphase plate. Just as in mitosis, there's a checkpoint that says everybody has to be in place before you can go on. And then separase, remember separase? Separase is the scissors. Separase is the enzyme that cuts the cohesins, releasing the attachment between the sister chromatids. In mitosis, separase cuts along the whole length of the chromosome. In meiosis, separase cuts most of the length, but it doesn't cut at close to the centromeres. And then the homologs can be pulled apart because the, sep the cohesion connection between the sisters has been released. But the sister chromatids are still held together by the cohesion around their centromeres. Then meiosis too can work exactly like mitosis, the only difference being that some of the cohesin has already been cut away and they're just held together by cohesin close to the centromere. So what we've done, we've gone through the physical issues of how meiosis happens, specifically how the homologs pair with each other and cross over. DNA strands break and form new pairings with complementary strands from their homologs. This is how the homologs find each other and align correctly along their length. Some of these breaks are deliberately misrepaired so that there are crossover connections where DNA from one sister is connected to a sister of the homolog. And then, because cohesin has tied the sister chromatids together, the homologs are tied together until everything is ready. When separase comes in, releases cohesin, allows the homologs to separate. Then in meiosis II, separase releases the rest of the cohesin, allowing what were sister chromatids to separate. Coming up next, we're going to again have a bunch of problems in which we follow genotypes through meiosis, this time thinking about the genetic consequences of crossovers, not just their physical consequences. I hope to see you there.